Bang, if you could please state your first and last name and spell both for the court reporter, please. Mark Vang, M-A-R-K-V-A-N-G. Oh. Officer Vang, how are you employed? With the City of Eau Claire Police Department. As a police officer? Yes, sir. How long have you been a police officer? Five years. All with the Eau Claire Police Department? Yes. Were you working February 26, 2018? I was. Were you dispatched to 1118 State Street, Apartment 2 in Eau Claire? I was. What was the nature of that call? Me and another officer were dispatched there for a uh, check person's call. Do you know the person, do you know who made the call? Yes. Who was that? Joshua Trinkler. And is that, if you recall, T-R-E-A-N? K L E R? Yes. Did you speak with Ezra McCandless when you arrived? I did. Is the person you spoke with and identified as Ezra McCandless in the courtroom today? She is. Can you identify where she's located by describing a location and an article of clothing, please? She is sitting at the defense table wearing a pink um, jacket. I Record will we uh, reflect that the witness has identified uh, Ms. McCandless, the defendant. Thank you. Did you have an opportunity to not only have contact with the defendant, but also speak with her? I did. Uh, where did that discussion initially start? It started on State Street, but then she requested to speak with me at the police department. And you said she requested that? Correct. Did you accommodate that request? I did. Did she say why she wanted to go to the police department? She just wanted to speak somewhere in private. Uh, how did you get, how did you and the defendant get to the police department? I drove her in my squad car to the police department. Was there an interview that was continued once you got to the police department? There was. Where within the department was that? in the interview room in the police department. Now at this point was, um, was the defendant being treated as a suspect of any kind? No. What was her role in the call as far as you were concerned at that point? A victim. During that interview, did the defendant describe a number of different incidents to you? She did. Uh, and who was the person other than her that was involved in those incidents? A person by the name of John Hansen. Now, were there a total of three incidents? Yes. Let's start with the, the first incident that she described. Did the defendant say where that occurred? She did. Where was that? At 135 Broadway Street. Did the defendant tell you approximately when in relation to the interview that incident occurred? About a week prior. What did the defendant explain to you about what happened during that initial incident? At the Broadway Street address, she was home at that residence with a John Hansen. There at the kitchen counter, John grabbed Ezra with his right hand. Now, let's just step back a second. Whose residence was that, if you know? Jason Mengels. Did the defendant describe to you the relationship at that time between her and Jason Mengel? She did. What was that relationship? Boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, was that both at the time of the incident as well as at the time of the interview? Yes. Was Jason Mengel home at the time of the incident, as described by the defendant? No, he was not. Uh, was there anybody else besides John Hansen and the defendant at the, the Broadway Street address, according to the defendant, when the incident occurred? No one else was home. And you said it started at the kitchen counter, is that correct? Yes. And you said that um, the defendant stated John Hansen grabbed her by the throat, is that right? Yes. Did the defendant describe what 
John Hansen did while grabbing her by the throat, according to her. That he squeezed her throat, which caused her pain, had a hard time breathing, and caused her to cough. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she told John Hansen to stop? She did not. She did not tell you or she did not tell him? She did not tell him. Um, did she tell you whether or not she tried to fight John Hansen off? She told me she did not. Did the defendant tell you what she did immediately after John Hansen, uh, according to her, grabbed her by the throat? She placed her hands on his wrist. Did she push herself away or back away? She told me she did not. What did, according to the defendant, John Hansen do next? He released his grip and then she backed away and then he then put her in a headlock. <coughs> according to the defendant, what did she do next? She did not fight back and she only put her hands up. According to the defendant, did John Hansen release her? He did. And according to the defendant, what did she do? She went and sat down on a couch. Again, according to the defendant, what did John Hansen do at that point? He acted like nothing happened and did not apologize to her. According to the defendant, did Jason Mengel ever come home? He did. Uh, when did that occur in relation to the physical contact as stated by the defendant? Shortly after um, Jason came home. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she told Jason what she claimed happened? She did not. She did not tell you or she did not tell Jason? She did not tell Jason. Did she say why she didn't tell Jason? She told me that she felt scared and ashamed. <clears throat> During your contact with the defendant, did you see any bruising or injuries on her? I did not. Is that something you would look for given the nature of what was being discussed? Yes. Now let's move on to the second incident that the defendant described to you. Where did that occur? At the address outside the city of Eau Claire. Uh, whose residence was that, according to the defendant? John Hansen's. Uh, when did that incident occur? According to her, a couple days after the first incident. According to the defendant, how did... Um, well, was, was this another incident between John Hansen and the defendant, according to her? Yes. How did the, the two come in contact, according to the defendant? Ezra was invited to John's residence, and John was the one who picked her up and brought her there. Did the defendant say why John invited her to the residence? To talk about what happened. Did the defendant tell you whether Jason Mengel was around the area during that second incident? No, she stated that he was off at training. Was that military training? Yes. Did the defendant tell you what time John Hansen picked her up? Around 7 p.m. And then he, according to the defendant, drove the two of them to his house? Yes. According to the defendant, what did they do when they arrived at his house? They both started drinking and got intoxicated. Did the defendant tell you what level of intoxication she was under? She told me that she got out to the um, blackout drunk. Did she say whether or not she got sick? She also indicated that she was um, throwing up as well. Did the defendant tell you if anybody else was home besides her and John Hansen? She did not mention anyone else. What did the defendant tell you happened next? That John 
brought her up to his room where he then turned the lights off and they were now both on his bed. Did the defendant tell you whether she was still sick at that point in time? Yes, she indicated she was still throwing up at that time. What did the defendant tell you happened next? She felt someone lay on top of her. Was she able to tell you who she thought that person was? She believed it was John, even though the lights were turned off. What did the defendant tell you happened next? That sexual intercourse took place between her and John. Did the defendant tell you what, if anything, according to her, John said to her during that sexual intercourse? That he told her to be quiet and to be a good little girl. Did the defendant tell you that she eventually fell asleep? Yes. And did she tell you where she woke up? She told me that she woke up on John, in John's bed with John laying next to her. Did she say anything about the clothing that she was wearing according to her? Yes, she indicated that her socks, underwear, and tights were off on the floor and that she was only wearing her dress. Did the defendant tell you um, if John Hansen gave her any directions once she woke up? She indicated that John told her to leave his bedroom and go to a different bedroom so that his roommate wouldn't think of anything else. Did the defendant tell you whether she complied with that request? She did. She said she went to a different room and laid in a different bed. What did she tell you happened uh, after she laid in that different room in a different bed? That around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., John then took her back to Jason's residence. And that's the 135 Broadway Street address? Yes. So this would have been the day after the night drinking at John's house, correct? Yes. Um, and does that take us to the third incident as reported by the defendant? Yes. What did the defendant tell you happened when she and John Hansen pulled up to Jason Mengel's residence? That John realized that Jason was not home and that John told her to go upstairs to Jason's, Jason's room with him. Did the defendant tell you if John, according to her, gave her any other directions other than to go to the room? Only to go to John's room and then to take her clothes off. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she did so? She told me she did. Did she tell you why? She told me because she felt like garbage. Did she tell you or give you an explanation of why she thought that John did that? She indicated that John did that because he gets off, of, off from it. And those were her words or similar to those? Correct. Did the defendant tell you what John directed her to do, if anything, once in Jason's room? To perform oral sex. Did the defendant tell you whether she did that or not? She told me she did. And during this incident, is it your understanding that Jason was still on military leave? Yes. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she and John Hansen had sexual intercourse in Jason's room? She told me they, they did. Did she tell you whether, according to her, John Hansen wore any protection? No protection was used. And did she say whether or not John Hansen ejaculated inside of her vagina? She told me he did. Did the defendant 
tell you whether or not she either fought off John Hansen or told him no? She did, told me she did not. How did she describe what John Hansen had done to her? She indicated, she indicated to me that he used me. After the sexual intercourse occurred, did the defendant tell you where John Hansen went, if anywhere? Yes, John went to a coffee house called Racy's to get, to get coffee. Did he ever come back, according to the defendant? He never came back. Uh, did the defendant remain at Jason's apartment while, uh, while John Hansen went to get coffee, according to her? She did. What did she say that she did in the apartment after John left? She indicated that she went to autopilot mode and remained in the residence. And autopilot were those words that she used? Yes. Did she say whether she took a shower and got dressed? Yes, she indicated that she also took a shower and got dressed. Did the defendant tell you whether or not she had continued uh, or whether John Hansen had text messaged her subsequent to the incidents we've talked about? He has. According to the defendant, what did John Hansen tell the defendant to do or uh, if anything? To erase the text messages that he's been sending her to protect him. Did the defendant say whether or not she actually deleted text messages? She told me she did. During this interview, approximately how long was that initial part where she talked about those incidents? About an hour. Um, and that's a recorded interview, is that right? Yes. Um, and your testimony today, is that consistent with what you've been able to review on that recorded interview? Yes. Now, in that interview, um, how would you describe the defendant's demeanor? And I can ask you some specific questions. Was she crying? Yes. Was she upset at times? Yes. Was she emotional? Yes. Um, did she ever ask for Jason Mengel? She did. Um, was that during the interview? It was. Did she make any specific requests as it relates to Jason Mengel? She wanted Jason there with her. Was that once or more than once during the interview? More than once. Did she say why she wanted Jason there? I don't recall. Do you recall her saying that she felt safe when Jason was there? Yes. Was Jason allowed to come into the interview room after your initial interview had been completed? He was. Um, have you had an opportunity to either review in live, real time from outside of the interview room or review recordings of the interview when Jason was in the room? I have. And is that which one of the two, in live time or uh, after the fact? Partially real time and after the fact. Now, during the time that Jason was in the interview room, did he ever offer to, to step out and allow the defendant to have privacy? He did. Um, what did the defendant say? She wanted him to stay in the room with her. Now, when you were interviewing the defendant, you said she was being, at that point, considered a victim, right? Yes. Did you tell her that she had to talk to you? No. Did you tell her that she could leave if she wanted to? Yes. Did you tell her that she could uh, tell you she didn't want to answer a specific question, one or another? Yes. Okay, and you kind of told her that she was able to control whether she was involved in that interview or not, correct? Correct. Nothing further, thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a recess. Uh, hopefully it's not real long. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to say, how long would you like, Mr. Nelson? 15 minutes enough time? Okay, then we will uh, uh, take a 15 minute recess. Okay, Jimmy may be excused. All rise. Yet to be marked Exhibit 683, the state has agreed that I can create 
from uh, the digital file that I have now onto a thumb drive and give it to the clerk over lunch break, but just in the sake of time uh, that this recording will be marked Exhibit 683. I'm going to play it from my computer. There are uh, times uh, that we have agreed that I can stop and fast forward or mute. I'm providing Your Honor with a copy of that list. I believe the state's preference is for me to just explain essentially what's on here to the jury. I've started it at 217.34 because Mr. Vang was not in the room until then. I've stopped it, you know, and then, Your Honor, I'm muting it for you this mean time. 2017? Yes, I misspoke, but that's the idea, is that I would, rather than ask the witness questions, that I would just say, Judge, I'm going to stop it here, I'm going to start it here, because there is no, Mr. Vang is in the room, there's no questions being asked of her. Does that sound appropriate? So, if I have this right, you're going to go ahead and do that, be playing these uh, during cross-examination now, and then you are going to make a thumb drive containing those portions of the audio recording. I will make a thumb drive including the entire recording and we'll make the sheet that your honor has, sorry for pointing at you, uh, exhibit 683B, which is the, uh, con you know, the table of contents for the portions that were played. Um, as best as I can, the version that I have on my computer, and I think it's the same version that the state has, doesn't give me the time as I'm sliding across. It just gives me one minute tick marks. Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to hit second marks. Um, All right. Well, my understanding is that it's being condensed to save time and agreed. not waste time. Uh, but there, there's nothing particularly uh, prejudicial. So if you do miss a little bit, it's not, not going to be a, a big problem. Correct. Correct. I would probably err on the side of playing 30 seconds when she's in the long room alone rather than start it up too late when there's content being provided. Yes. All right. All right. And uh, Mr. Hahn, is that uh, your understanding of uh, your understanding? <laughs> yes, Judge. The index, I think this is defense counsel's intent. That's just a guide for completion of the record, not something that would go to the jury or be published or be even marked as an exhibit. Unless it's just a sub exhibit, that's fine. Okay. However, Your Honor wants to handle it, I think we should, it should be part of the record. All right. But I agree, it doesn't need to go to the jury. The second portion, again, the recording is 55 minutes. I'm trying to condense it. Um, I understand it's the state's preference that if after I play the tape, we can conclude Mr. Vang's cross examination prior to taking a lunch break. I have some questions to ask after the tape is done, but it's obviously most of the content is in here, and so I'm going to be. Hopefully, I understand you may uh, disagree, but I hope to be a short cross. Very well. Okay, ready to proceed? Yes, sir. All right, then uh, let's bring the jury in. All right, Mr. Nelson, then uh, you may go ahead with your cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. The defense moves for uh, the admission of Exhibit 683, which is a recording of the first 55 minutes of Mr. Vang's interview of Ezra McCandless on February 26, 2018. No objection. Exhibit 683 will be received. Um, okay, you may go ahead. Judge, uh, permission to publish? You may. Um, I'd ask the screen be turned on so I can play the... Uh, do you actually mind sitting next to the chair quickly? I'll move out the rest of the chairs in that way. If you need anything, water or a snack, I'll try. I'll, I'll do what I can get it for you, okay? All right, so my name is Mark. Um, I feel quite determined. Uh, before we begin, like I said, you're, you're free to leave anytime you want. You can stop talking wherever you want. The door is only closed for privacy. You, you can leave anytime you want, okay? Just let me know that ahead of time. How do you spell your first name? E Z R 
A. What's your middle initial? J. And how do your last name is? M. C. C. A. N. D. L. E. S. S. Is your date of birth? October 6, 1997. Do you have a phone number? Judge, I'm pressing pause, at, or excuse me, I'm muting it at 2018-38 until 2019-13 based upon an agreement that there's irrelevant demographic information that does not need to be displayed in court. Pressing the volume again. Josh Cottos, uh, he was concerned about your safety and uh, Jason's safety. He was concerned that he felt like you guys haven't slept or haven't eaten in days. And he didn't know. I'm going to press pause to see if I can make it louder. Sorry. Madam Clerk, are we able to make it louder? We're up as high as we can go. Okay. Looks like mine is as well. Play again, Your Honor. You guys were tired from that, or you guys were exhausted from that. So that's our first concern: is making sure you're okay physically. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys are, um, he also mentioned that you or Judge Jason's upset about something that happened to you that hasn't been reported yet. Reported yet. Okay. Um, again, if you don't want to talk about, it, that's fine. If you do, that's fine too. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. So we'll start with what you come up with as far as you, you told me that it happened here in Eau Claire, correct? You know where? It happened at, the first thing that happened was at Jason's house, and then the second thing that happened was at John's house. Okay. Uh, we'll go with, um, what happened at Jason's house? <coughs> at Jason's house, John grabbed me by the throat twice. Okay. Any reason why he did that? It's because he liked him. He likes to do that? Like, is that like a, a fetish of his or? I think so. Okay. Was well, there any kind of warning sign that, like, did you, did you do something? Did you say something? Did he do something? Did someone else say something that? I was sitting on the counter after I made some coffee and I was talking to him and he just grabbed me by the throat and no, nothing grew to me. Okay. And then the second time I got off the counter and he put me in a headlock and he held it there and it really <laughs> made me very uncomfortable. Some questions I may ask you, and they sound really redundant, very obvious, but these are questions that I have to ask just to get more you know, clarity as far as, for example, like you mentioned that he grabs you in the throat. Do you use a right hand or left hand or both hands? It was his right hand. When he grabs you the right hand, did he squeeze your throat, or did he just like, put his hand around your throat? Squeeze my throat forcibly. Okay. Did that cause you to have any trouble breathing? Yes. Okay. Did you lose consciousness at all? Did no. you black out? I felt, I felt really lightheaded after the second time. That was the headlock, right? Okay. Do you see any kind of those, like little fuzzy, shiny things floating around when that happens? Have you ever had that experience before where you show it's a breath or you get a wind knocked out and you also mm -hmm. see like little like glaring things floating around? Mm -hmm. Okay, so but that didn't happen though. Okay. 
I just coughed a lot. Okay. This is props to her now. Okay. When he had his right hand on your throat, did you have to, how did you get away from that grab? Then you just sat there and he let go. Okay. Were you hitting his hand at all? Were you telling him stop? Were you telling him no? And this was quiet. I just grabbed his hand. Okay. And grabbed his wrist. It's like six foot something. Really big. Okay. How long was there between when you were sitting at the counter and he grabbed your throat and then he let go? How long after that did he be in a headlock after you walked away from the counter? It was suddenly. Okay. When he had in the headlock, was he where he was his left hand arm around you or was his right arm around you? I think it was right. Okay. If, if there's anything that you don't know, that's fine too. Maybe. If there's anything that you don't want to answer or if you just want to take a few minutes and break and just kind of take your time, that's fine with me too, okay? If there's any questions that you don't feel comfortable with me asking, that's fine too. So don't be afraid to say, you know, like, I'm not comfortable answering that or I don't want to talk about that, that's fine. It doesn't mean that you don't care, it doesn't mean that this isn't real, it's just take your time. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to rush you. Uh, if it feels like I am, just tell me, okay? When he had you in, his, in the headlock, did you also have trouble breathing? That's what made me cough. Okay. When you had, when he had you the headlock, again, how did he did you have to fight him off? Did he let go eventually? I put my arm up and he let go. Okay. Was there anyone there when this happened? Okay. And uh, you mentioned a counter at Josh's place. Is the kitchen? Um, Jason's place. Jason's place. Okay. Just the kitchen. Okay. Does Jason live here? Judge, I'm pressing pause at 20, 26, 26, uh, because there's irrelevant demographic information provided. I plan to press the sound again at 20, 26, 43 now. Okay, so after he grabbed a bit of the rope with his right hand and the headlock, and he let you go after the headlock, what happened after that? I just went and I sat down and then he acted like everything was normal. Okay. Did he sing anything to you? Did he apologize? Did he... He didn't say sorry. Okay. Did he sing anything else, did he say anything else to you during that time uh, after you sat down?
Now, when I say this, I'm not trying to accuse you or anything, but what was the purpose of you being at Jason's place that night? I was dating Jason. I'm oh, sorry? Jason is like my boyfriend. Okay. So you and Jason are dating. Okay. That I did not know, so I just want to kind of clarify, you know, that makes a lot of sense why you were there. Why was John there? Because John was one of Jason's friends, and he was my friend, and he came over because Jason was gone, and he wanted to just hang out and do art with me. Okay. So Jason was at home then during this time, okay. Jason got home. It wasn't very long. Yeah. Very shortly. Did you tell Jason what happened? I told him everything tonight. Okay. But at that time when it happened, you didn't tell him. Okay. That's what he's so, so upset for me. Was there a reason you didn't tell Jason what happened that night or that day after you? Because I was really ashamed and I was really afraid. When this incident happened, did John touch anywhere else or do you make any permission to? Did he do anything else to you? Did he You know, is he just grabbed by the throat and then put you in the headlock. And each one caused you to have trouble breathing, cough, but you did not black out with consciousness. Okay. So after John left and Jason came home, John left. The second incident happened outside. Josh's place? You said John's house. John's house. When did that take place? Was that the next day? The same day? It was, I think it was a couple days later when Jason had to leave for drill because he's in the army. Okay. And John wanted me to come over to his house to talk about everything and talk about stuff. And he bought wine and things. And I thought it would be okay to have some wine and just try to talk and try to understand what was going on. And then I got really, really, really drunk. And I was almost black up drunk. And I was throwing up. And he had me go upstairs when I started throwing up. And he took me upstairs and he put me in his bed and I was throwing up. I just remember a lot of, I don't know, it's a big mess of a bunch of fumbling and stuff. It was awful. When you were in John's room, was the light on, light off? It was off. Now when you say fumbling around, was it like 
someone on top of you, someone laying next to you, or you... It's not Did you for sure know it was John, or that it was just someone on top of you? It was John. Okay. And you felt this, what happened next? It's really hard to remember because of how drunk that I got. Okay. And he went to my uncle a lot, and I remember he was on top of me, but then it didn't. <coughs> I was too drunk and like things were I don't know, things weren't working for him, working for him or something. Mm-hmm. And then I fell asleep. Mm-hmm. I just didn't think it was right. It messed me up really bad. Okay. Do you think or believe or know was there any kind of sexual intercourse that happened that night? I think so, but he's telling everybody that there wasn't. Okay. And that's why Josh is being very productive about it. and your redness that you know of? No. Okay. I just don't know if you don't use any protection. Okay. No protection? Did you fight, scratch, kick, or anything that you remember of? No. Did you say, try to get off? No. Did you try to he, you know, hold you down by force or do you remember anything like that? Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. Sorry? After you felt sitting, you woke up, work, you know where you were when you woke up? Where were you? I was in John's bed. Do you remember having any clothes on? Blankets, cover sheets, anything like that? I had blankets on, but I didn't have my tights on or my socks. Were you wearing underwear that night? No. I didn't have any on. Oh, you didn't have any on either? Okay. Did you have a shirt on or like a tank top or what did you have on top? I still had a dress on. Were you able to find those clothes that belong to you? Or were they located at? They were on the floor. And we just kind of scattered. Where was John when you woke up? He was in the bed. Was he laying next to you on a different bed or? He was laying next to you. He woke up and he told me to get out of his bed and go lay in the other bed so that his roommate wouldn't think anything. Was the other bed in a separate room or same room? In a separate room. He told me he didn't want his roommate to think anything. the other bed or where did you go after that? I went to the other bed and I just laid there until the morning. 
When you woke up, was it still at night time? Was it the next day already? It was the next day. Okay. When you went to, uh, do you remember what, what time you went to John's house? I think it was after he got done with work, so around 7 p.m. a.m.? Yeah. Okay. When you woke up, you know what time it was? It was really early. It was like, it was like at 5 or 6 in the morning. Okay. So you went to the other room around 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Um, but you went in there, you just laid there, correct? You said you laid it the next morning or? I laid, until, I laid there until he got up and then so he could take me home. Okay, do you know what time that was? I think that was around, I think it was around 10 or 11. Okay, and John took you home? The thing Jason's most upset about is what happened at Jason's house after he took me home. Okay. He took me all the way back home to his family, correct? Or where did Jason go? Jason's house? house? Okay. Did they happen on a ride home from John's place to Jason's place? They happened at Jason's place. Okay. Nothing happened in the car at all. Oh, okay. So after. John woke up and took you to Jason's place. What happened then? I got, I got there and I thought Alex, our roommate, would be there, but he was at work. Mm -hmm. And I got there and he told me to go upstairs to Jason's room because, because he wanted me. try to fast forward to 2049 minute mark when Mr. Vang returns eight minutes later from his current exit. Pressing play at 2048-41, Mr. Vang enters, I believe, in another 30 seconds. Up in 
Ich bin Sven. Try to say this to make you relive what happened, but when you say use me, what do you mean by that? Okay, 
so he went somewhere else. I can remember now what he said the night at his house. What did he say? When he was on top of me, he just kept telling me to be quiet and he kept calling me a little girl. It was so weird to me. And I told Jason about it and it made him really upset. And I really vividly remember it. I didn't like that. Judge, I'm stopping it at 20, 55, 54, and uh, I'm not, uh, the defense does not intend to play any uh, additional portions of the recording. You were in the courtroom when the uh, recording was played? Yes. And I think I misspoke before. This contact that you had with Ms. McCandless was on February 26th. Is that right? Correct. Okay. I don't know if I said it was on the 27th or the 26th before, but we're talking about February 26th, 2018. Agreed? Yes. And just to kind of give the big overview of things, you were responding to a check person call. Is that right? Yes. Um, and the check person call was in relation to a person named Jason Mengel. Agreed? Yes. There was another officer um, from Eau Claire Police Department named of Tyler Stevens that was also involved, correct? Yes. You and Mr. Stevens went there because Josh Trankler called the police to say he's worried about Jason Mengel, correct? Yes. And then you went there and you gathered some basic information, correct? Yes. Uh, in particular, you talked with, or you heard somebody talking with Jason Mangel, right? Yes. Um, and what you came to learn is that he was extremely upset. Yes. Angry. Yes. Um, to s some extent he was, Josh Trinkler had concerns about what he might do based upon his anger. Agreed? Yes. And you, uh, as part of that, then came to learn that uh, the emotional aspect of this was Jason was upset about what he believed had happened to Ezra McCandless. Agreed? Yes. So then Mr. Steven stayed and spoke with Jason. Is that right, Mr. Mango? Yes. And then you, I don't want to say pulled aside, but kind of went to the side and spoke with Ms. McCandless briefly, right? Yes. Um, and asked her, basically, you're looking for the background to say what happened that made Jason so upset that Josh had to call the police about it, right? Yes. Um, and Ezra said, well, let's go down to the station and we'll talk about it then, correct? Yes. But Ezra wasn't the one that called the police. Correct. All right. Um, she was asked by you if she was willing to talk to you about why Jason was upset, right? Yes. And then she agreed to do so, right? Yes. In the recording we just watched, um, there's, uh, I think there's a recording that lasts probably upwards of three hours. Is that fair to say? Yes, about three hours, yes. There's. Uh, you're in a room speaking with Ms. McCandless where you're gathering the facts that you can, right? Correct. And then at some point, um, well, you're in and out of the room, but at some point uh, you leave the room and Jason Mengel arrives and he's in there with Ms. McCandless, correct? Yes. Providing her comfort or care, those sort of things, correct? Yes. Support, right? Correct. Uh, and there's some time lag there where Ms. McCandless is waiting for other people to arrive. Is that right? Yes. Because you had told her there's a whole, is it a crisis response team that can show up and help women that are, uh, that need support in these situations? Yes. And you had told her about that, is that right? I did. And then you reached out to those contact people, agreed? Yes. And you 
told them to come to the Eau Claire Police Department. Yes. And then uh, those two women, eventually two women arrived, correct? <coughs> yes. And then uh, between when you interviewed Ms. McCandless and the two women from the crisis response team, that's the time that Mr. Mengel was in the room providing Ms. McCandless with emotional support. Agreed? Agreed. And then eventually the crisis response team is there, and that's all on tape as well, correct? Correct. And as a part of that, you've reviewed that whole tape, is that right? Yes. And as a part of that, you saw her being provided with um, a red folder, agreed? Yes. And that had all kinds of pamphlets for support for women in her position, agreed? Yes. All right. Um, so I want to go, that's, again, fair to say, a, a, the overview of what you had done that night. Yes. And when I stopped the recording, there's still, again, much more recording, but the fact gathering that you had done had essentially been completed at that point, right? Yes. All right. And you, um, how long have you been an officer? Five years. Do you have um, any specific training regarding the interviewing of victims of trauma? Just through what we learned at the academy okay. and experience. All right, but nothing in particular that you've been to any trauma training? No. Or no particular training in, uh, on how to interview victims of sexual assault? No. But through your five years, you've had experience of being in that position where you've spoken with other victims of abuse. Agreed? Correct. And your role there to begin with, you were trying to gather facts, right? Correct. You were trying to do it with the skills that you had to the best of your ability. Agreed? Yes. Um, and you did that by uh, being polite and asking soft questions, right? Correct. Giving her choice in some uh, autonomy. Agreed? Yes. As best you could, right? Yes. Um, but you were still asking her pointed questions, right? Yes. Um, because, again, you were trying to gather the facts to see what you could, what she knew. Agreed? Correct. Um, in some of those times, you would ask pointed questions like, did this happen? <coughs> Correct? And fill in the blank. Agreed? Yes. Um, you didn't mean it in a manner of, like when you asked, did you fight or kick or scratch? You'd ask questions along those lines. Agreed? Yes. You certainly didn't mean any judgment by asking that question, right? That's correct. You're not implying that a woman in that situation is supposed to fight or kick or scratch, correct? Correct. Or that a woman in that position can't fight or kick or scratch, correct? Correct. You're just trying to gather facts. Yes. And you do that by asking these pointed questions about did this happen or did this happen, correct? Yes. Um, you, fair to say during that interview, never told her, can you tell me more about what happened? You never used that phrase, did you? Correct. Um, you didn't say, tell me more about that. Agreed? Yes. Um, they were, for the most part, these closed pointed questions that you thought were the most helpful way for you to gather facts. Yes. And when you, um, did that, she gave you answers, right? She did. Um, she talked about, I think has been characterized as, uh, three different events. Is that, that's what uh, it's been characterized thus far, right? Correct. Don't object to cumulative. We've watched the video of the interviews. Um, it's sustained and cumulative. I want to ask you some questions about that first portion of it, okay? Okay. Um, it's not unusual. You've investigated domestic abuse incidents before? I have. You've investigated sexual assault incidents before, correct? I have. It's not unusual in those incidents for there to be no witnesses other than the two participants. Objection right? relevance. It goes to relevance. I can follow it up here quickly. Well, I'm going to overrule. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Fair to say in your experience that those are typically not witnesses to those events. Agreed? Yes. Do you know this gentleman over here to my left with the blue shirt and the black tie sitting behind the prosecution team? I do. That's Investigator Proc? 
Yes, he is. He's somebody that works in your office. Correct. Um, and you're aware that after you conducted this initial fact-gathering interview, eventually Ms. McCandless met later on with Mr. Proc. Is that right? <coughs> I'm not asking you the content. I'm just saying, are you aware of the fact that those two met to speak about the same incident that she spoke with you about? Not right away, but eventually, yes. As you sit here today, you're aware that that occurred? Yes. Um, and what Ms. McCandless described about the first incident was the, and I know it's, I'm just trying to get into the context, that it's a uh, time when she says John Hansen put her hands on her throat or a headlock, right? Yes. Uh, are you aware that upon further investigation, the Eau Claire Police Department determined that there was actually a witness to that event other than John Hansen and Ezra McCandless? I did not know that. Okay. Um, <coughs> the, you asked Ms. McCandless about uh, how she responded in all three of these incidents, correct? Yes. Uh, and she described a situation in which there was no weapon involved in any way. Agreed? Agreed. She agreed, said that she never said John had a knife, did she? She never did. She never told you that she thought her life was threatened, did she? She did not. Um, you, um, she expressed to you in describing what was happening, or you asked her questions about her not reporting it, is that right? at least to her boyfriend or to others. Right? Yes. And she expressed to you her feelings of shame, right? She did. And again, that's not unusual that you've heard that when you speak with other victims of these types of events. Agreed? Agreed. Um, she uh, responded to you at one point that she, quote, thought I was a piece of garbage for going to his home. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and at another point, she expressed to you, quote, I let him use me. Is that right? You're going to object to cumulative. It's Sustain. We can't repeat everything, Mr. Nelson. Right. We have a time limit. And, uh, you know, we got to keep this moving. So I, I can't have you asking the There's same question multiple times. I don't believe he has. There's three specific okay, quotes just, that please, I want. Okay, just move on. Just move on. Uh, one of the things that she expressed that she was upset about that hasn't been asked about was her, she told you that he's telling everyone there wasn't sex. Agreed? Yes. Do you know if there was any additional investigation later to determine whether eventually John Hansen changed that and admitted to having sex or not? I'm not aware of that. Okay. At the... Um, When you were, just briefly, she told you at the end of all of this, at the end of the third incident, she went into what you, she said was shutdown mode, right? Correct. She used the term autopilot. Yes. And again, that's not unusual based upon your training and experience that you've had with other victims of assault to express a similar type of feeling. Agreed? Yes. That's all. Thank all you. Right. Any redirect? Briefly, Judge. Uh, <clears throat> officer, it was a bit hard to hear the recording. Would you agree? Yes. And the testimony that you provided, either if it was hard to hear or if it was outside of that part that was played, your testimony was consistent with what you saw in the video and the additional portion that wasn't played, correct? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that there were some questions about resources and information that was provided by two women who were part of a crime victim response team to the defendant, correct? Correct. So that information was, as you stated on cross-examination, information that let the defendant know there were resources if she was in a situation similar to this one that she described, correct? Yes. So if she was being interviewed by a male and she wanted to speak with women, she could have relied on those resources, correct? Objection. We approach. All right. yeah. Objection overruled. Do you remember the question? Can you repeat the question? Um, the information, there was information provided by two women from a crime victim response team to 
the defendant, correct? Yes. And that was uh, information about resources that she could call or reach out to if she was in a situation similar to this one in a in a in the future, correct? Objection, no foundation. He doesn't know what they told her. Overruled. Yes. And you have experience with uh, the crime victim response team in your employment, correct? Yes. Okay. So you're familiar with the general type of information that they provide? Yes. So uh, the information that was provided on February 26, 2018 to the defendant uh, provided her with resources that she could have relied on if she was in a similar situation or being in interviewed by a male or somebody else uh, in the future. Is that correct? Yes. Nothing further. All right. Any recross? Just this issue about what resources were provided. When she met with the victim crisis response team, you weren't in the room, were you? No. You don't, uh, other than through, if you've watched the recording at the time, you didn't know what was told of, to her, correct? Correct. Um, when you conducted the interview, you didn't tell her, hey, if you want a female officer in here, you can do that, correct? Correct. Uh, yeah, and she, she acknowledged that she was okay speaking with you, correct? She did. But you never availed her of this uh, apparent opportunity that the state was alluding to that she could ask for a female officer. You didn't tell her that, correct? Correct. And you don't know what, if anything, she did with follow-up with people from the victim witness or the, the crisis response, do you? I do not. Um, you don't know if she went to Bolton House Refuge and spoke with people there? I do not know. You don't know what they told her? I do not know. You don't know uh, if she went to the Chippewa Falls Family Wellness Center and spoke with people there? I do not know. You don't know what they told her? Correct. Um, and you certainly understand that uh, any human being who's suffered for trauma may or may not be able to avail themselves of all the opportunities for help. Agreed? Agreed. Sometimes when people are suffering from that trauma in the moment, they can't necessarily ask for the help that they need, right? Objection calls for speculation. Yep. Sustained. Um, well, there's this uh, implication that you gave in your testimony that a woman who's been assaulted once should know in the future what she needs to do during some future assault. Is that what you're saying? Objection. I think that misstates the testimony and it's uh, sustained. I agree. That's certainly not what you're implying, is it? Repeat the question. You're not implying that because a woman was assaulted one time, that they would absolutely know how to respond if that ever occurred in the future. Objection, uh, asked and answered, speculative. All right, I've already sustained the objection on that, so. Can we approach, Judge? No, I don't think we need to approach on that, uh, Mr. Nelson. So if you would uh, wrap up your recross. Um, the questions that were asked of you on redirect were about what was told to Ms. McCandless by crisis response workers. Agreed? Agreed. You don't know what was told of her. Agreed? Agreed. That's all. Okay. Uh, Officer Vang, I believe you're free to go. Uh, anybody intend to recall Officer Vang? No. Okay. You're free to go, sir, and free to step down. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. For your time today, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.